Uh, listen, have I mentioned that this is going to be a lot of fun? Have I said that to you guys? Uh, this, this construction zone, uh, church-wide study and sermon series was created and designed by your staff from scratch. And it's going to be a lot of fun. I hope that you're going to be a part of it. There are some tough topics that we're going to be talking about, uh, like handling conflict and anxiety and anger and you know, difficult things that all of us deal with it sometimes as Christ is building us to be more like him. It's going to be a lot of fun. Hope you'll be a part of it. Um, I, I want to start this sermon today. We're talking about truth, and, and I, I want you to imagine something with me, if you would, whether you're here in the room or whether you're at home. Would you just imagine for a second that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, was here in this room? was with you in your room, wherever you're watching this right now. Would you just imagine that he's here? And, and you can maybe see him standing up here somewhere near the front. And, and here's the reason I want you to do that, because this sermon really is about him today. It should be about him every week. But today especially, because what we're going to discover is that Jesus, when he came here, he came in grace and truth. And that's what we're talking about today is facing the truth because sometimes that's hard to do. Um, and I want to start with a, a story, too. Uh, I have Debbie's, Debbie's permission to share this story with you uh, because when she allows me to do that, it means that she gets a new pair of shoes. And uh, if we can just keep our dog Murphy from eating her shoes, we're okay. So a few years ago when uh, Jim Towson was uh, about this tall, we, we decided to go on a trip to North Georgia with our friends, a, a family that good friends, one of Jim's classmates uh, was with us. And so we went on this trip, and we went to Helen, Georgia. And while we were there, we went downtown. I don't know if they still have it or not. This is back in the uh, 1900s. They had uh, go-karts downtown, and you could go to this place and ride go-karts. So, so we went down there, and we told the boys, hey, well, let's go do something fun. We're going to go ride go-karts. So we get down there, and we pay our money, get our tickets, and we get in line, and we're walking up to the line. We're waiting for our turn as this group of go-karts finishes up. And as we get closer to the, to the uh, man who's taking up the tickets, we see there's a sign there that says, uh, you must be 10 years old to ride this ride. Well, Jim Towson saw it, and he pointed out to us that he was just 9 years old, even though his best buddy was 10 years old. And so uh, he turned around. He says, Mom, he says, the, the sign says that I have to be 10, but I'm only 9. And so Mom said something to him that some of you moms would probably say. We're already in line, and we, you know, he was only a couple of months away from being 10. And so she says, just tell him you're 10. Well, uh, that, that sounded like a good plan. He's like, no, no, I can't do that, Mom, because I'm only 9. She said, just tell him. And all the others that were with us are like, just tell him. We all want to ride. Just tell him. Of course, I probably said, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> so he gets up to the line, the, the, his buddy's in line ahead of him, and the guy says uh, to his buddy, says, so uh, how old are you? And uh, he says, uh, well, I'm 10, and he was. And then he goes on, takes his ticket, and he goes on, gets in the car, and he turns to Jim, and he says, and uh, young man, how old are you? And Jim says, well, I'm nine, but my mother told me to tell you I was 10. <laughs> And he kind of looks, the man looks at Debbie's like kind of stunned. And Debbie says, I'm not his mom. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, he had to face the truth. Um, somebody asked me after the 855 service because I didn't finish the story, did he get to ride or not? Uh, the answer is no, he didn't yeah, because of the truth. And the man said, no, you have to be 10. So, you know, we gave him some ice cream to soothe the pain. But, you know, the truth sometimes, we, we have a hard time facing it. And that's what I want to talk about today. In uh, John, we hear the story, in the prologue to the Gospel of John, we hear the story of Jesus coming, and he comes with grace and truth. So I want you to read along with me. It's in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. Uh, the Word, capital W, of course that refers to Jesus Christ. The Word became a human being, and look what it says, full of grace and truth lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory he, which he received as the Father's only Son. John spoke about him. That's John the Baptist. He cried out, this is the one I was talking about when I, when I said he comes after me, but he is greater than I am because he existed before I was born. Out of the fullness of his grace, there's that word again, 
He has blessed us all, giving us one blessing after another. Verse 17, God gave the law through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth. I, I like the way the Passion Translation uh, shares verse 17. Look at look what it says. It says this. It says, Moses gave us the law, but Jesus, the anointed one, unveils truth wrapped in tender mercy. Jesus came in truth, and he came in grace. I was looking at that word truth because this series is about truth, and if you missed last week's uh, sermon on what is truth, you can go to the website and catch up with us. But, but here's the Greek word for truth there. It's called aletheia. And, and here's what it means when you go to see the definition. It means this, what is true in any matter under consideration. You, you see that. It, whatever the matter is, whatever it is you're looking at, there's truth and there's truth. And it's true in any matter. Jesus came with that understanding. He was truth. And then and the other, ver the other uh, definition was of a truth in reality in fact, I think that should be certainty instead of certainly. But, but I added my definition to it because we talked about this last week. I think what it really means here, what it's trying to say is that this truth that he came in is absolute truth. So what is absolute? That's the way he came, that truth. You know, Jesus would often uh, use a particular phrase when he was speaking to people in the gospel accounts, and you'll see that. It, the phrase is, I tell you the truth. Some versions will remember from the King James will say, truly, truly, I say unto thee, truly, truly. I, I, I tell you the truth, Jesus would say. And, and I was wondering if you, I, I actually did a, a, a you know, search to see how many times that phrase appears. It, it appears uh, several times in the gospel. So I want to test your knowledge. Let's see who's good at guessing, or you may know the answer to this. I wonder how many times he said that. Was it 28 times, 48 times? 68 times or 88 times? Just shout it out. How many times do you think he said it? 68. 68 times. That's a lot, isn't it? And, and you'll see that in Matthew 26, he, I mean, in Matthew, he did it 26 times in Ma Mark 12, in Luke 8, in John 22. So this was, this was something that Jesus would say often. And I wondered why he would do that. And I looked, and some scholars say, well, it was just a figure of speech. You know how sometimes we'll say, now, I'm going to be honest with you. And every time I hear somebody say that, I'm going to be honest with you. It's like, mm, so you weren't honest with me with everything else you said until now. I mean, that's, I don't think that's what Jesus is doing. I think what Jesus is doing when he uses that phrase is he wants to drive home an aletheia, an absolute truth. And so you'll see he uses it often. Let me, let me give you a couple of examples. Here, here's one. In Matthew 13, he says this in verse 17, I tell you the truth. There's that phrase. Many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they longed to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. it Jesus is saying this is a truth. This is an absolute. There are prophets who are in the Old Testament, and, and they wanted to, to see and hear what you have seen and heard, but they didn't get to because they didn't live in the time that I came. It's an absolute truth. They, they longed to hear Messiah is coming to know that Christ has come. But they didn't see it. We did. We do. Luke 12. Here's another example. He says this. I tell you the truth. Here comes some tough teaching. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, the Son of Man will also acknowledge in the presence of God's angels. Man, I read stuff like that and it's like, if I don't publicly acknowledge him, not, not just with my voice and with my speech, but also in the way I live and the way I act and the way people see me, if I'm not acknowledging Jesus Christ in this world, then he's not going to acknowledge me when I get before the Father. That's scary. But it's an aletheia. It's a truth that Jesus shared. And, and the question, if you were to go and search all of those I will I, I tell you the truth, you're going to read a lot of things that are hard and tough. And the question is, what do we do with them? What do we do with these truths that Jesus spoke? And so I want to talk about that for a minute because there's some truths that you and I need to know. And, and here's the first one. It's a reality for a lot of people. It says many people, many people know the truth. They just aren't willing to face it. 
Uh, many people know the truth. We know that because God has revealed himself to us through creation. Through, I mean, go out at night and look at all the stars in the heaven. Look at the creation uh, in the world and, and what all we see. And it tells us in Romans in chapter 1 that, that God has made this known to us. Look what it says. They know, everybody knows the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. And that's true. We're without excuse. We can't say we don't know the truth about God. But many people don't want to face it. And so I thought about a famous line from a famous movie that some of you will recognize right off the back. Uh, let's watch this little clip of the video. See if you remember this. I'll answer the question. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Remember that line? You can't handle the truth. I mean, it, it, that's the reality of the truth of Jesus Christ. A lot of people just can't handle it. It's not a question of knowing the truth. It's a question of facing the truth. So there were people that Jesus spoke to in the Bible, and they had that same difficulty facing the truth and handling the truth. Let me tell you about some of them. Last week we talked about Pilate. I mean, Pilate is standing in the presence of the truth himself, Jesus Christ, and he turns his back on him and goes out to the crowd. The Pharisees and the other religious leaders were often confronted with the truth as Jesus spoke it and demonstrated it in their presence, but they didn't receive it either. In fact, they turned the opposite way and worked against the truth until they put him on a cross and killed him. There's a, there's, a, there's a story of, uh, of a really good man who knew the truth, heard the truth, but wasn't willing to face it. And that's the story. You remember the story of the rich young ruler. It's in Matthew 19. You remember this guy? He was a good guy. I mean, this is somebody who was a good Jew. They were following the law. They were doing the right things. But they came to Jesus with a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says in verse 17 there in Matthew 19, Why are you asking me what is good? There's only one who is good. Of course, he's referring to our Heavenly Father. But to answer your question, if you want eternal life, keep the commandments. Now watch what this good man who was a believer in God, who knew the truth, look what he, look what he says. Jesus says to him, you must, you must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbors yourself. And look what the man says. I've obeyed all of these commandments. There's no hint that he was lying when he said that. He was probably speaking the truth. He said, what else must I do? You know what's beautiful about that is he, he understood this man without really uh, acknowledging it. He understood that keeping the law wouldn't get him there because he says, what else must I do? I've been keeping the law. There's got to be something else. So Jesus told him. If you want to be perfect, and what he means by that, if, if you want to be complete in what is needed to gain salvation, here's what you need to do. Go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But when Jesus, when the young man heard this, look what it says, he went away sad. He went away sad, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth. There's that phrase. It is very hard for a rich, man, rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. I'll say it again. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. A good man, a Jew, who heard the truth, knew the truth, but couldn't face it. And he went away sad. He couldn't handle it because of what it meant he needed to do. So I asked the question of myself, and, and if you're okay, I'll ask it of you too. Are, are we really any different? Are, are there any hard truths that you and I need to face about our life? You know, for this rich young ruler, it was, it was bad news for him to hear what else he needed to do. He considered it bad news. But, but here's, here's the reality. And this is the second point I wanted to cover. With, without bad news... There can't be any good news. If there's no bad news, then how do you know what good news is? You know, you know what uh, you hear often? Do you have people that say to you this? They'll say, uh, 
hey, I've got some good news and some bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? Don't you just hate it when somebody does that? It's like, well, listen, hey, I'd love to hear the bad news. Go ahead and give that to me, which is what most of us choose. I usually say, give me the bad news because somehow the good news is going to temper that, right? It's like I can, I, can, I can handle the bad news if the good news is good. And, and that's the truth of this good news, this truth that Jesus Christ brings to us. We have to accept the truth about the bad news before we can receive the good news. Let me give you another. I tell you the truth. Look at this one. It's in Matthew 18. Then he said, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. You see the bad news there. The bad news is this. Because of my sin, if I don't turn from my sins, because I'm a sinner, I'll never get into the kingdom of heaven. That's the bad news. It's truth, but it's bad news. But look at the good news. The good news is because of Jesus, because Jesus died for my sins, if I turn from my sins, I will get in to the kingdom of heaven. There's good news and there's bad news. But, but here's, here's, here's where I go back to Jesus standing here before us this morning. When Jesus came, we learned in the scripture reading that he came full of grace and truth. There, there's a, there's, it's both. Now, last week after I uh, preached about truth, Matt Dorsey, I told him I was giving him a shout out today. He uh, pulled me aside when I saw him a day later, and he says, hey, it just reminded me of this book that Randy Alcorn wrote, and the name of it is The Grace and Truth Paradox. He says, there's a lot of good stuff in there. It's a short read. You might take a look at it. So I did. I, went, I got the book at his recommendation, and I'll recommend it to you. It's by Randy Alcorn. You might want to write it down. It's called The Grace and Truth Paradox. It's all about Jesus coming both in grace and in truth. And here's what he actually says in there at one point. He says, listen, Jesus didn't come with 50% grace and 50% truth. He came with 100% grace and 100% truth. But sometimes the truth comes across as bad news. It just seems like bad news, but it's actually good news, which means grace and truth go together. Here's what Randy Alcorn says in the book. He says, if we minimize grace... The world sees no hope for salvation. If we minimize truth, the world sees no need for salvation. And, and so it takes both, grace and truth. Without grace, truth really has no positive value. And without truth, grace has none. It takes both of them. Jesus came full of grace and truth. So, so let me put some flesh on that for you. And I'm going to borrow the story that Randy told, which is an, an amazing story, about his father. His father uh, was a tavern owner. Down here we would say he was a bar owner, right? And, and so he described him as the most resistant person Randy had ever known, Randy being in ministry, had ever known that, to the, that was resistant to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every time he would say something to his father about you know, matters of faith, his father would say, don't even talk to me about that stuff. And so Randy kind of knew that was just not going to do any good. Well, as his father began to age, at age uh, 84, he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And uh, it was not good. And there was one day, apparently, when his father was really struggling with this, that he called up Randy on the phone and he said to him, he said, uh, I'm calling to say goodbye, and I've got a gun to my head. I'm sorry to leave you with such a mess. And, of course, you can imagine Randy's reaction. Randy lived in the same city. They were about 30 minutes apart. He's like, Dad, you can't do that. Don't do that. I'm coming over there right now. Please do not do that. His father hung up. He got in the car, and he raced over there, and he said when he, he, he came to the door, and, and he called out to his father, and there was no answer, and he walked in, and he saw a gun and a rifle on the floor, and, and he just knew that his father had taken his life, and he was calling out for him, and no response, and he walked around the corner, and his father came walking into him as he did, still alive. 
He rushed him to the hospital to get him some help, and they discovered that there was, there was a need for surgery. He had to have surgery with part of his cancer, and so they scheduled it for the next day. And Randy, the whole time, was praying, God, I've got to be able to tell my father the truth. He needs to know the truth, and so please use this as an opportunity for me to share Jesus Christ with him. And so he said he, he, he went the next day before the surgery, and he was praying as he was going that dad would turn to God. And he said, I wanted to share the good news with him, but I knew that unless I told him about the bad news, he wouldn't know the truth of the good news. And so here's what he did. He stood by his bed and he opened his Bible to Romans. It's giving him sort of the Romans road to salvation. He says, I began reading in chapter 3 where it says, There is none righteous, not one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He said, those weren't easy words for me to share with my father. My tavern owner father had always taken offense at being called a sinner. I wanted to gloss over this portion, moving quickly to the good news of God's grace. But I forced myself to keep reading verse after verse about human sin. He says, why? Because I told myself, if I really love my dad, I have to tell him the whole truth. If God's going to do a miracle of conversion here, that's his job. My job is to say what God says. He said, we made it to Romans 6, the wages of death, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then Romans 10, about being saved through confessing Jesus as our risen Lord. And then look at this last part. Finally, I looked dad in the eyes and asked, have you ever confessed your sins and asked Jesus Christ to forgive you? No, he said in a weak voice, but I think it's about time that I did. And so right there on that bed, Randy led his father to Jesus Christ, and he became a believer. You know, without the truth of God's holiness and the stark reality of our sin, Christ's grace is meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. And the worst thing that Randy could have done, the worst thing that we could do, when it comes to others around us and me and Jamie as your pastors, is to not tell you about the bad news. Because unless we tell you about the bad news, you won't receive the good news. So I wonder, are, are, are we willing, are you and I, are we willing to face the truth of our sin? You know, the reason that we can do that, face the truth, is because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And so here's what Randy says about that. He says this. He says, when, when you boil life down to the basics, there are two kinds of people. There are sinners who admit their sin, and there are sinners who deny it. Which kind are you? He says, the way to no longer feel guilty is not to deny guilt, but to face it and ask God's forgiveness. And then the last one is this. The Christian life is not based on avoiding the truth, but on hearing and submitting to it. The greatest kindness we can offer each other is the truth. Because if we never face the bad news in our lives, we won't ever experience the good news of Jesus Christ. So, so let me give you two more of Jesus as I tell you the truth. Then I'll quit. Here's the first one. John 3, verse 3. Right before we get to, for God so loved the world, right? John three sixteen. Listen to what he says. I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It just won't happen. That's good news, and that's bad news for some. And then in John 5, 24, he says this, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life right now. And so last week I said the truth matters. It does matter. It matters eternally. Listen, there are some really good people in this world. Some of them may be here. Some of them may be listening or watching online. Listen, there are some really good people in this world who still haven't faced the truth of the sin in their life or the need to change their life or, or the, the need to face the reality of their circumstances. And what Jesus is saying, my grace is sufficient for you. It's enough. Listen, I went to the cross for you so that you could face those things in your life. 
And, and so I wonder, you know, if, if you're listening to this message, if you're hearing and you're, you're, you're still imagining Jesus Christ in this room right now, and, and you're a little bit conflicted about this whole idea of facing the truth, then can I suggest something to you as your pastor in love? Because I love you. Maybe it's time for you to have a conversation with God about that. Maybe it's time for you to sit down and say, Lord, there's some things in my life that I'm just not facing right now. And, and I've heard today through your word that, that you have this grace that's available for even for me right now. Would you help me to receive it? Would you help me to deal with the truth in my life right now? Because Jesus came in grace and truth. It wasn't with one or the other. It was both. And, and that is really really good news for all of us. And so maybe there's something you need to deal with. You know, I felt kind of bad uh, when I finished the 855 service. That I meant to say this to you, Jamie, because I felt like I didn't give people in the room or online sufficient time with Jesus Christ to maybe face some of the truth. And so I, I want to do that now. Where, where's Taylor? Are you going to play? Where's Taylor? Taylor, will you come and just play a little music for me? Because I, I want to give you a chance to do that. I mean, listen, listen. All of us have some sin in our life that we need to face and receive God's grace on. And so wherever you are right now, um, let me give you these next steps, and then I want to pray for us. So here, here's the first one. I, I'm going to face the bad news of my sin and my guilt. I confess my sin and ask for forgiveness. I receive the grace and the truth from, from Jesus today. Grace and the truth. And I'll follow Christ's example. I'm going to talk about this one next week. I will follow Christ's example of being full of grace and truth and the way that we interact and live our lives with others. So we'll, we'll tackle that one next week. But I want to give you just a moment where we are to pray. And if you want to, you can, you can come to the altar and do that, uh, or you can just pray where you are right now. And, and here's, here's, here's our prayer, Lord. First, Jesus, we believe you're in this room with us. We believe you're with every person who's watching and listening right now. And you're standing in front of us in grace and in truth. There's a truth that we all need to face. But there's a grace that we all need to receive. And so this morning, would you hear from your children as they pray to you to receive that grace, to face the truth, and to know that when you stand in front of them or with them, that you're not mad with them or us or me. You're not upset. You're not angry that we continue to fall at times. You, when you came and you would say, I tell you the truth, I, I really believe, Jesus, that you didn't come and say that in a harsh way. You came and said that with as much love as you and the Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit could share it with. I tell you the truth. And part of that truth is how much you love us. And how much you were willing to go to the cross to pay the price so that we could receive the grace and be forgiven. So thank you for doing that today, Lord. Reminding us of truth that is full of grace. That truth's in you. And lastly, maybe, maybe there's somebody who's listening. Maybe somebody who's heard today the story of Randy's father. And maybe they've been that harsh father who didn't even want to hear about things of faith. But you realize today, I need a Savior. It's about time that I confessed my sin and asked for forgiveness. And if that's you, listen, Jesus is willing. He stands before you now, willing to forgive you and to receive you as his own. So that even in this life, you'll go from death to life. And you won't go away sad. So thank you, Lord. 
Thank you for coming in grace and truth and for loving us the way you do. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.